Welcome to the river. So today is Father's Day and most of you probably know that my father passed away just a, a couple of weeks ago. And so that means that this Father's Day is kind of different than normal. I want to thank all of you who've been praying for us and, and who have um, reached out with gifts and, and words of encouragement. My father lived a long life and, and, and because of his relationship with Christ, I know that he's in a better place now. Of course, that doesn't mean that we miss him any less. It's kind of complicated. And maybe some of you are feeling that same thing on this Father's Day. I know that this day means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Maybe some of you never even really knew your father, or maybe you had a broken relationship with your father, or maybe like me, you have lost your father recently, or maybe, maybe some of you are dads who have lost a child or who have a broken relationship with your children, or, or maybe, maybe you feel like a failure as a dad. I don't know. But today is a day when we honor and remember our fathers. We have a tradition here at the river uh, where we hand out pop for our pops. Each year on, um, on Father's Day, we have a, like a row of, of specialty um, soda pop uh, that is available um, and, and people can come up, all of our dads can come up after the service and grab um, one or two to take. Um, this year, there's a slight change. Typically, I offer a variety of different kinds of pop. Uh, this year, um, I'm handing out only root beer on Father's Day, and that's because it was my dad's favorite. My family was actually reminded of that recently, this uh, just about a year ago, uh, when my, my dad was sick and he was in the hospital and, and in rehab center for a little while. And so we went out to visit him and, and we spent a lot of time in his room hanging out with him. And the doctors and nurses wanted him to eat and drink more so they basically said he could have whatever he wanted. And, and for, for my dad, that meant a lot of root beer. And um, every time after he would um, take a, a, a sip of root beer, he would like lean back and close his eyes and he'd be like, mmm, that's good root beer. And so for my family, we still use that phrase. We talk about that every time we take a drink of root beer, we, uh, we use that phrase. And so today um, I'm, I'm handing out root beer for Father's Day for uh, instead of different kinds of, of pop for our pops, I'm specifically giving root beer because it was my dad's favorite. This Sunday is actually our first Sunday meeting back in person again. Although we're going, going to continue our online sermon, um, uh, we're, going to, um, we're going to continue to offer everything like we've already been offering it because we know not everybody can be there on Sundays. We even have people joining us from all over different parts of the world, and we're so thankful for that. So we're going to keep this going. Uh, so for those of you who will be there in person, you're going to be able to grab a, a bottle of root beer. And for those of you who are not able to be there, um, I'm just hoping that maybe the next time you drink root beer, um, maybe you'll remember this story and remember my dad and hopefully even remember this sermon. So let's take a moment now and, and pray for our dads and for our time together. Heavenly Father, um, we do recognize and honor our dads in this Father's Day. Um, I know that it means different things for different people, and for some, this is a very difficult day. And so I just pray for peace and encouragement. I pray for healing and wholeness. I pray for um, just reminders of the fact that no matter what this day represents for us, that you are our perfect Heavenly Father, and we just thank you for that. Um, I pray that you'd be with us as we dig into your word today, that you would help us to be attentive to what you want to say to us. And I pray specifically for me, that you would help me to be attentive to what you want to say through me, and that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Now, you might be wondering, um, so why are we looking at Revelation 22 as a Father's Day message? That seems kind of strange, and, and I get that. That's a great question. Um, so typically, each year on Father's Day, I like to look at a dad from Scripture uh, to see what we can learn from him, not about um, being a dad, but about just following the Lord. And this passage doesn't fit that motif. But I thought this year, instead of looking at a passage uh, based on a dad from Scripture, what if I looked at a passage um, that talks about something that my, that my dad taught me? And so that's what we're doing today. So you see, my, my father always ended every prayer I ever remember with the words, until we see you face to face. Um, and it wasn't just me. I, so as I put stuff on Facebook, I saw a lot of comments uh, of people who remembered this about my dad. Every, for instance, every mealtime, he always ended the prayer with, 
um, and bless this food to our bodies and us to, to your use until we see you face to face. And that was just always a constant in his prayers. And um, that idea then of one day seeing the Lord face to face was ingrained in me over and over every time my dad prayed. So for today, we're going to look at a passage of scripture that talks about that time. So um, before we look at the passage, let me just say, let me just ask this question. Um, what do you know about the book of Revelation? First of all, um, let me point out that, that um, we're going to get into this book in depth a little more in September. Um, so for those of you who've been um, a part of our services in the past, you know that for the about the past 18 months, we've been going through the, the Bible one book at a time, looking at um, a different book each week uh, with some different things that inter interrupted us along the way. Um, but we'll be in Revelation, the book of Revelation in September. And at that point, we're going to dig in a little deeper. So I'm not going to go too deep into all of the background now. But I do want to point out just a couple of things. So the name of the book uh, comes from verse 1. Actually, the first word of verse 1 in the original Greek is the word apocalypsis, which means a revelation or a, a, a disclosure. It's funny because from that word, we get the word apocalypse. And, and that has come to mean the destruction of the world or like some kind of cataclysmic event. But in reality, the, the root of the Greek word simply is about revealing or unveiling that which has been hidden. Now, the next two words in the original Greek are the words Jesus Christ. And so this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It goes on to say that it is to John. So who is John? So John was the beloved uh, disciple of Jesus, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, the writer of our fourth gospel. John wrote this about 60 years after Christ's ascension to heaven, after all the other apostles had been martyred, and after John himself had been exiled to the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea to live out the remainder of his days. While there, he received this revelation about what was to come. Now, if you've ever read it, you know that it's not a clear timeline of events with everything laid out in detail for us. It's a difficult book with lots of symbolism and imagery, with mentions of strange creatures and events uh, that are hard to wrap our minds around. There are different schools of thought about how to interpret what was written, and, and we're going to wait until September to really deal with that kind of stuff and to dig into all that. But let me just say that however we view this revelation, we need to remember that it had meaning and purpose for the church at the time, as well as down through the ages for us. The passage we're going to look at comes in the last chapter of this book, making it also, therefore, the last chapter of the Bible. And it's looking ahead past the rapture and the tribulation and past even the millennial reign of Christ as John is receiving a glimpse of what it will look like after the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth. And that's where we pick things up in Revelation 22, beginning with verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So right away we see this imagery that I mentioned earlier. It's a beautiful picture filled with lots of meaning. First, let's talk about the river. What do you make of this river of the water of life? So the river of life or the spring of life or spring of living water, or different concepts like that have been prevalent throughout scripture, both the Old and the New Testament. Um, Jesus even talks about it in his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter four. You may, may be familiar with that passage. It refers to eternal life. And we see here this river flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, running down the main thoroughfare available for everyone. And notice that on either side of the river is the tree of life. So what's the tree of life? So this is not the first time that we're introduced to this tree. We find it in the beginning as part of the, the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis. After Adam and Eve sinned, they were banned from the garden so that they could never eat from this tree again. Uh, which meant that part of the curse of sin was death. So in this book of Revelation, we see that when Christ returns and ushers in his reign and brings about a new heaven and a new earth, 
that what was begun in Genesis will be brought to perfection, that everything will come full circle, and once again we will have access to this tree of life. And here, even, it seems to be multiplied, like it's lining the, the river of the water of life on both sides, and it has 12 different kinds of fruit. Uh, it's, it's like this wealth of life that will never run dry. And not only is it life-giving fruit, but even the leaves themselves uh, are, are for the heal, for actually for the healing in the nation specifically. It's a beautiful image. It makes the artist in me kind of overcome with trying to imagine what this must have looked like. What about you? What kind of emotions and thoughts does this invoke in you? You know, right now with the unrest and, and lack of peace in this world, it's, it's like palpable. It's like right there. And with the, the pandemic, has, has people um, are thinking about sickness and suffering and dying and, and this, with the struggling economy, people are anxious and uncertain about the future. And we add to that the current state of racial unrest that, is, uh, that it has us thinking about the history of injustice and inequality in our society. And it's like we can just see the brokenness all around us. This passage is speaking of a time when all of that will be gone. And, and not just gone, but healed. There will be a wholeness in this world that we have never really experienced. And along with that wholeness, there will be purity and goodness. Let's take a look at what comes next with verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. What do you think it means to no longer have anything to, for there no longer to be anything accursed? Sin and sin's curse will be gone. You know, it's no mistake that it seems like this world today is broken. We're living in a world that has been cursed because of sin. It is broken. The unfairness and injustice and all the other ills in our world come from sin and sin's curse. This passage is looking ahead to a day when all of that will be healed. The curse will be gone. There'll be no more sin, no more death, or pain, or sickness, or guilt, or shame, or anything like that. This broken world will be made whole. And then in verse 4, we see our restored relationship with God. This is the verse that my father's prayer points me toward. He always prayed until we see you face to face. And this verse says, they will see his face. What do you think of those words? Did you know that throughout scripture, we see that man is not allowed to see God's face? Our sin separates us from him. Even the moments when someone got a glimpse of God or had an intimate time with God, they were still kept from fully seeing his face. Like Moses in the wilderness, uh, when, when God chooses to have him go in a cleft of the rock and he puts his hand over him and passes by so that Moses only sees his back. We have been separated from God. We can't see his face because of his holiness and our sin. Jesus eventually broke down the barrier of sin and allowed us to be reconciled with God. But even as Christians, even though we can come into his presence, it won't be until we get to heaven that we will see him face to face. This phrase suggests an intimacy with God that has been unavailable to us since sin entered the picture. One day we will see him face to face. It goes on to say that his name will be written on our foreheads. What do you think that means? I think this suggests identity and belonging. I believe that when sin entered the picture and man became separated from God, we lost our identity. Since then, we don't know who we are because we have forgotten who we belong to. Sin, at its basest form, is man trying to take God's place. We talked about that this past week, actually, in our online Bible study. In Genesis 3, we find Eve choosing to decide for herself whether or not the fruit would be good to eat, 
rather than to listening and obeying what God had already said about it. We try to take God's place. We want his role. But in trying to grab his role, we have lost our own. We have exchanged our identity and our belonging for lostness. But in the end, there will be no confusion. We are his, and that will be evident. Then verse 5 speaks of no more night and this amazing light. What do you make of that? My daughter, Kaylin, will like that. Uh, she actually gets annoyed at having to go to bed. She thinks sleep is a waste of time, and she would just prefer that we had no need for sleep. We could just enjoy the days. But when I think of there being no more night and seeing the light that is mentioned here, I think it will mean more than just some bright light, more than just daytime all the time, more than just the warmth of sunlight. I believe it will be an all-encompassing light that leaves no room for darkness or fear or doubt or hatred or bias or lies or baggage or confusion or any other things that cloud our vision. Do you know that Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. This light in verse 5 is God's light. Holy, perfect, amazing light in his presence, driving out all else that does not belong. Altogether, these verses give us an image of having a perfect, intimate relationship with God in a world that is healed and whole and good, where darkness and sin and sin's curse are no more, and where we can be at rest in a way that we have never known before. That's something to look forward to. Now, before I close with one final thought, uh, is there anything else that you will take from this passage? The part that I want to close with is that idea of seeing Jesus face to face. Going back to where I started the sermon, my dad looked forward to that day. You could see it in the way he ended his prayers, but you could also see it in the way he lived his life. Growing up, I don't ever remember my dad missing his devotions. He had an intimate relationship with God and looked forward to that day when he would see him for eternity. Now, that does not mean that he hated life here on earth. He enjoyed his family. He loved my mom. He worked for the Christian Missionary Alliance for over 30 years and loved his job and felt like he was doing kingdom work. He loved all kinds of things like root beer, which I mentioned earlier. My dad lived a good long life here on this earth. But while he enjoyed this life, he knew that what was coming would be even better. So he looked forward to seeing his Lord face to face. And that defined how he lived life here on earth. So the challenge for me is, am I living for today and for this world? Or am I looking forward to that day when I will see my Lord face to face? And, and am I letting that define how I live today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have to look forward to, this amazing picture, this amazing image of peace and light and goodness and wholeness and healing and life. Help us to look forward to what is to come. Help us to look forward to that day when we will see you face to face. Help that to, to then encourage us and challenge us about how we live here on this earth. May we be your faithful servants until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name I pray.